Okay, so I think, so I appreciate, the pie example ex ex um, actually covers quite a lot of bases. Some of you have done really well and completed it, but I mean, people haven't normally completed it by this stage. It's not, it's not a simple example. So you should go back to the pie exercise after this lecture. But what I want to do is, is, is to try and explain three things. So Gordon, I'm just going to start lecturing now. So is that okay? So I'll just go. So we can, we'll come back to the, the, the example immediately after us, sorry to buy in. The three things which are very commonly misunderstood in MPI, motor types and communicators, all of which are, are, are um, features of message of point-to-point -point messaging. So I'll cover the use of MPI modes, S send, B send, and send. I'll cover the meaning and use of message tags and the rationale for MPI communicators. These are all commonly misunderstood. It is essential for all programs to understand modes, and that's why this lecture is here. It's not simple, it's unfortunately complicated, but I'll try and explain where it all comes from. Tags can be useful, and in a more advanced program, you may exploit communicator management. But just at the moment before I go, are there any questions people have about send and receive? I mean, and they're not as simple as a lot of people, oh, send, receive, yeah, off we go, right, that's send. It's not as simple as that. So does anyone have any questions at the moment? I mean, just at all about, about send and receive. Does the sending task continue after the sending as soon as the receiving task has finished receiving? As opposed to um, sending it off and then continuing? So that's exactly what this lecture is about. So this, is exact, this lecture is exactly about that exact point. So that's a very good case. That's, so that's, so NPIS send it stands for synchronous send. It's guaranteed to be synchronous. The routine will not return if the message has been delivered. So that's why, that's why I ask you to program with MPIS send because it's, it's absolutely explicit what it does. It's like making a phone call. You, 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 you send a message and you wait until the receiver is posted. Okay? <coughs> MPIB send, which I don't really cover much, but is guaranteed to be asynchronous. Okay? So this is like making a phone call. This is like sending an email. The routine returns before the message is delivered. Now think about it. How so I'm saying I, I I'm saying to MPI, here's some data, right? I want to send it asynchronously, like posting a letter, okay, or sending an email. Off you go. So this is an array which I'm telling MPI to send. Okay, what's the what, what am I going to want to do with that array sometime in the future? Okay. What what will I want to do with it? I've reserved a megabyte of storage or something like that. I'm not making myself clear. At some point in the future, I want to re I want to reuse that data. Okay? I can't say to MPI, send that message, and I will never touch that message ever again. Okay? So what you're saying to MPI is, please deliver this message. Don't tell me when it arrives, but I want to reuse it at some point in the future. Okay? So if you think about it, the only way you can implement asynchronous communication is for the system to take a copy. Okay? That is the only way you can implement asynchronous communication. The only way you can say, please deliver this sometime in the future, I don't care when, but obviously I want to be able to reuse the storage okay, at some point. But, but I don't know what, so, so, that is, so that's why MPI calls it B-Send, buffered send. It's there to, to, to enforce, the, to, to make it obvious to you, explicit, that in the MPI B-Send is mandating to MPI, please buffer this message, take a copy of it, and deliver it sometime in the future. That is exactly asynchronous send, but the implementation requires buffering. The confusion is that MPI send, if you look at 99.9% of MPI programs where you use MPI send, this is the standard send which you're expected to program with. But the reason I don't use it for teaching is it may be implemented as synchronous or asynchronous. You do know not which, you do not know which, and this causes endless confusion. Okay, so so I'll try and cover why MPI does this. Um, so here's my, so first MPI S send. Process A calls an MPI S send. S send X to process B. I'm using some abbreviated syntax here. And process B is running some other non-MPI code. So what happens at that point? What, what does process A do? Because it's S send. So it waits, it waits. So exactly. Process A waits in the S send, okay? So uh, this is potential deadlock. You've made a phone call. Now, with a correctly written MPI code, at some point in the future, process B issues a receive. It says, I would like to receive some data. I'll put it into Y from A. 
And at that point, the data transfer happened. You're on, and there's a synchronization in time. This is why it's called synchronous send. It's like the, you know when somebody phones somebody that at some point they're both on the line at the same time. That's why it's called synchronous send. There's a synchronization in time between sender and receiver. So there's a synchronization in time, and the data transfer happens here. If you think about it, it is in principle possible for this data transfer to happen with no intermediate copying. Because they're both on the line at the same time. You say that I've got this data X, I want to send it, well I want to put it in Y. Okay, so that in principle, in principle, this can be done with no, no intermediate buffering. Then the S send returns and the receive returns. Now, technically, technically, the S send returns once the receive has started to happen, but that is really a nicety I wouldn't find. You think about the S send returning once the receive has happened. I, I, technically, that's not quite true, but it really is not, not an important because it doesn't really matter. Making a phone call is a good analogy here. When the S-Send returns, it is now safe for process A to overwrite X. Why is it safe to process A to overwrite X? Why can I now overwrite, why can I now overwrite X? Why would it not? Because B has received. Because it's synchronous send, you know that B has received it, so that's fine. And when the receive returns, that now means that Y can be read by B, obviously. So that's, but the important point is that when the S send returns, uh, X can be overwritten by A. Okay, that's the important point. So what happens if we use asynchronous send, which is B send, which I haven't really covered, but, okay. Same thing starts at the start. B send X, B process B, okay. So, process A says I want to do an asynchronous send, which is, which is like sending an, an email to B, and process B is running to follow an MPI code. At that point, what happens is there is a copy taken, and the B send returns, <coughs> and X can be overwritten by A. So it doesn't matter what type of send routine you use, you can always overwrite the send buffer when the, when, when the function returns to you. If it's synchronous, you can do that because the data has been delivered. If it's asynchronous, you can do that because it's been copied, but you don't really care. Either way, when, when a send routine completes, you can overwrite the send buffer because it's guaranteed that it will, it, that's not going to affect what data is sent. So now, process A just carries on doing what it likes. What's, what it likes. So there's no synchronization in time between A and B. That's why it's called an asynchronous send. At some point in the future, process B issues are received, and at that point, the data is transferred, okay? The receive returns, presumably this data is freed up in some way, and um, Y can now be read by B. So we've achieved the same thing, but this looks better, because there wasn't all this waiting around. And also you might say, well, it's better, because if I didn't issue a receive on B, my code wouldn't deadlock be a bit of a memory leak, but at least it wouldn't deadlock because the data would just stay at the buffer. Yeah? Yeah. Right, so let's, let's make it so that, that's exactly the point. So where does this memory come from is the, is the, is the question. That's what I'm going to talk about. So that's exactly the So that's a very, that's exactly what, I, that's exactly the point I wanted to make here. So note, Receive is always synchronous, okay? So if process B had issued the receive before the B step from process A, then B would wait and receive until B step was issued. So the reason I've done A ahead of B is if B is ahead of A, if the receive is posted early, then the synchronous and the asynchronous look kind of similar. So it's not really a big deal. The question, where does the buffer space come from, okay? So for, so, for, so this is hard. So, so, the, so what MPI says is, well, okay, B said guarantees that the, 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 the send is asynchronous. It guarantees the message is buffered. But you'd be a bit annoyed if you never used B send and 10 gigabytes of data were used up by the MPI library. It said, oh, I've reserved 10 gigabytes for buffered send. You're like, well, I'm not going to do buffered send. So, so in MPI, it's up to the user to provide a single large block of memory. And there's this horrible routine called MPI buffer attach. What you do is you, you, you allocate some memory. And then you, you, 
you give it to M you allocate a gigabyte or a megabyte and you give it to MPI and you say to MPI, when you do buffer and send, this is where you need to store it. It's up to you to allocate that memory. The problem is that it can in principle be quite difficult to work out how much memory that should be because the next the processor could do another B send here, another B another B send. It could, it could, could, because with S send, it's by definition you cannot have more than one S send outstanding at once. You can't be on two phone calls at once, at least if you're only on one phone. But with non, you, you can send as many you can send send as many emails as you want quickly. Okay, you can post as many letters as you want to the letter box, and the post box it can fill up. So it's kind of nasty because it's hard sometimes to work out how much data you should reserve. And the worst thing is. If you reserve some data, you might run the program 100 times, it's always OK, because by the time the next B send has been issued, maybe process B has received it. But maybe once process B is really slow for some reason, and you start sending too many messages, and this fills up. And if you run out of buffer space, it will crash. Because MPI B send mandates this message will be buffered. If A issues another B send before the receive system tries to store the message in the free space in the buffer, if there's not enough buffer space, B send will fail. Even worse, you might say, um, my mess I'm going to send two one megabyte messages. So how, 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 how big does the buffer space need to be? If I'm going to send, uh, if I'm going to have at most two one megabyte sends outstanding at once, how big, how much space do I need? Yeah, but plus a bit, because it needs the headers. So you need to allocate two megabytes plus a bit, and this is horrible constant called MPI B send overhead size. It's all horrible. So, yeah. So you can you you can MPI buffer, detach, and then reattach. But the, that's not really the model. The model is meant to be that you say to MPI. And in a lot of situations, you can bound it if you know that you're doing halo exchange up, down, left, right. You know there's never going to be more than four messages outstanding, so you can you can you can allocate the the, the, the the space. But it is all a bit horrible. But the MPI model is not buffer attach, B send, buffer detach. It's buffer attach right at the start of the program. I say to it, here's your gigabyte of data. So people in MPI do not tend to use B send. Okay, most people you will you will see it used rarely. Okay, B send is not commonly used. Um, Although you might say it's better because it avoids all this hanging around. Okay? And the reason it's not commonly used, well, I don't really know, I have to say. I mean, it's like why don't Fortran programmers use functions? Why do they use subroutines? Well, they just do. Okay? Why did why does the UK have on the left? Do. Okay. So, yeah? Do you last point. Can you directly? Well, you could, but so, so the idea, you, you allocate the memory, you malloc a gigabyte or a megabyte. You, that's done presumably not by any processor, that's during the center. That's done by you. So, so in MPI, it's up, it's up to you. To, so you call MPI init, and then if you want to use vSend, you have to allocate, you have to give MPI the buffer space for it to buffer them. So you have to then malloc or allocate the data. But, but it's meaningless, though, because that's supposed to be for MPI. You don't know what it's doing with it. So you could read it, but you're not supposed to. You, you know, it, it, it's, yes, you could. It's just your memory. Sorry, it's just memory and user space, but it's, 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 MP, it's for MPI to do what it likes with it. But, but you shouldn't. It really is if you hand it over to MPI. So the rat, so what, and so, so, so here's the problem. SN runs with a soup deadlock. B says it's much less likely to deadlock when your code may run faster because we don't have this, what you might call unnecessary synchronization. But the user must apply the buffer space, the routine will fail if this buffer is exhausted. So MPI send tries to solve these problems. What MPI send says, okay, the system will provide some buffer, okay? I don't know, a megabyte or something, I don't know how much, some, some amount of, of, of buffer. And send will, no, MPI send will normally be asynchronous. Normally, MPI will try and buffer the message and, 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 and then carry on. This is probably what you want. You don't want to wait around. However, if the buffer is full, rather than failing, it says, well, I'll just send it synchronously. I will wait for it to be delivered. 
So this is supposed to give you the best of both worlds. It means that um, small, typically small messages are sent asynchronously in MPI, and large messages are sent synchronously if you use MPI send. But it does call, cause an, an enormous amount of <coughs> things because you do not know if MPI send is synchronous or asynchronous. And the threshold at which it switches over, I mean, in fact, MPI could legally say, on Wednesdays, I will do MPI send synchronously, and on Thursdays, I will do MPI asynchronously. It's perfectly legal. Um, what it, in practice, what it does, okay, it's some really weird bit on here, uh, with my, in practice, what it does, sorry, I'm, I'm going the wrong way. In practice, what it does is it will have a threshold that small messages will be buffered, but you don't know what that is. It's implementation dependent and stuff like that. So when you use MPI send, you should always assume that it could be, you, you should, for a correct program, we we'll always assume that MPI send could be synchronous, okay? So well, you see an awful lot of this kind of stuff in MPI programs. Process A does a send of X to B, and process B does a send of Y to A, okay? So if these were S sends, okay, if these were S sends, this would be guaranteed to deadlock because they're both trying to phone each other at the same time. They're both saying, I will not progress until a receiver has been issued, but by but you're into catch 22 because you can't issue a receive because you've not progressed past the S send. So this code is not guaranteed to work. However, it will probably work because for small messages, the send will probably be implemented asynchronously and buffer. But this is a very dangerous situation. You have a code which works, but you're just lucky that it works. And you might not care if you're writing it, but if you know if you're flying an aeroplane with this kind of code, you know, you probably don't want this to. So you see this all the time. You see technically incorrect MPI programs, and, and it is—it's a bit of a subtle point, but it, you, you have to realize that this pro, this code is technically incorrect. It might deadlock. You're probably lucky. You probably get away with it, but probably getting away with it is not good enough. And the biggest issue is that people often port codes to Archer, and then they say, "Oh, this MPI is broken on Archer. Uh, my my code is hanging." Well, they might have written something like this, and the whole point is that. Typically, what the system will do is it will say, I will reserve enough buffer space for one outstanding message to every, every possible destination. Okay? So that means the more processes you run on, the smaller the buffer. And each process has to store, has to buff, be able to buffer a message for every possible destination. As the number of processes goes up, the number of destinations goes up. So, so, so the threshold between going from, from, from asynchronous to synchronous shrinks. So people have only ever run on 8 or 15 or 20 processes before. They suddenly run on 1,000 or 10 or 20,000 on Archer. Suddenly their code doesn't work. That's because the system, it's, it, it, its internal buffering is very small. So that is why I tell you to program with SSEND. Because if you make a mistake, if you program this with SSEND, it is guaranteed to deadlock. And that's what you want. You want an incorrect program to go wrong. You don't want incorrect programs to just happen to work. Okay? And I don't know. It's, it's the, this is the equivalent of bug of saying, you know, doing int i and c and assuming that i is, is, is set to zero. Okay, maybe, but it's not defined in the C standard that the integers are in. <laughs> so, to avoid, so how could you avoid deadlock here? How could you, how could process A and process B exchange information and guarantee not to deadlock here? And sort of similar to the, the solution we took for the message round of ring, yeah? Uh, switch one of them around. Yeah. So A does send, receive, and B does receive send. So in simple situations, that solves the problem. However, it's not a general solution. So one of one of the example programs, if you if you do finish the Pi program, the next example is a ping pong, where what happens is you get two processes just throw messages at each other. And it allows you to measure the performance of the interconnect. You throw a megabyte between each other and see how long it takes, and that allows you to measure the bandwidth and latency. And there it's very simple. Process A sends and receives, and process B receives and sends. However, this does not generalize. And so a more general solution uses something called non-blocking communication. So non-blocking communication is the way which in practice, you guarantee your code is deadlock free. And I'll cover that on the Rupert, we'll talk about that tomorrow. But I said, for this course, you should program with SSEND because it's more likely to pick up bugs such as deadlock than send. That's why I say program with SSEND. Because if you write a program with send, it may work just because you're lucky, and you don't want that. You want incorrect programs to fail. Um, um, what would happen if you were to send, if you could S send from A to B, and B send from B to A, and 
that would be fine. Okay. Because you do that sent to me, you'd be waiting for my receive. I'd be sent to you, which would mean I would then get onto my receive, which would receive the message, and then it would work. So that would be okay. But, but, it, but it's still in there. Like again, you're then having to make this, you're then having to 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 to, to, to classify your processes and to send us some, you know, odd and even, and it just it doesn't generalize to a three-dimensional unstructured problem where each process has an average number of neighbors, for example. I mean, you, you, for individual situations, you can come up with. And then you'd have to have a BSEM, which is ugly because you then have to MPI buffer attach a buffer, which is pretty horrible. So um, it, it, it is, and some people gloss over this, but it isn't, you know, this is the number one but misunderstanding in MPI. People think that MPI send is guaranteed to be asynchronous. It is not guaranteed to be asynchronous. It normally is for small measures, but it is not guaranteed to be asynchronous. And, as, and again, deadlock is the major problem. So that was really. Um, um, that was really um, all I had to say. I mean, it's not. It, it, I mean, I didn't. I didn't understand this stuff for many years. But luckily, there were people at, at EPCC who wrote MPI libraries, so I could go to them and say, "Look, I don't understand this B send, S send, send stuff. Could you explain it to me?" And because they had actually implemented the library, they were able to explain the rat. Not only, not only. The tech, not only the specification, but also the rationale. This is why it's done. And the rationale is, let MPI decide if it should buffer or not. So MPI might like to buffer small messages, but it might like to not buffer large messages. Because remember, with synchronous, sorry, I'll get me off of that. with synchronous communication, in principle, the data transfer can happen without any copying. So if I'm sending two gigabytes to you, you probably don't want to copy that. It's probably better. To, to, do a sync, to do synchronous send and then do a direct peer-to-peer -peer transfer, which in, on some modern networks like the Aries can in principle be done with no with uh, no copying, no buffering, which is nice. Can a synchronous send happen simultaneously with a buffer receive or many buffers? So there's no such thing as a buffer to receive. The rece do you mean the receiver of a buffer? A buffer send. Right. So re so a receive is just a receive. It matches any send. But yes, you could, well. No, well, remember, if, if you have synchronous send, you can only be, you can't, that's all you can be doing. So ask your question again, can, can? Well, I thought that would also, that would also be a buffer of the C, but apparently that is not the case. No, so there's they thing called a non-blocking receive, which achieves what you want. Okay. So we'll talk about that for a moment. A non-blocking receive, rather than saying, waiting for data to come in, you say, I want to receive a message. When it comes in, put it there. And then technically, it is a slight thing. In an MPI, that's called a non-blocking receive, not buffer. But you're right, it achieves the same thing. You say, look, when the message comes in, put it there, and I'll go away and do something else and come back. So non-blocking operation, which, are, which Rupert will cover tomorrow, and I used to have um, to do these deferred things. You know, the the non-blocking send is, send that message. Look, Send it sometime in the future. I'll come back later to check whether it's gone or not, but just send it sometime in the future, and I'll come back and check. And they're called non-blocking because the routine doesn't block for the operation to take place. They return immediately. And then you might ask, well, how do I reset? And, and my analogy, Rupert may use it tomorrow, is, 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 is like um, sending a message via courier. If you want to send a parcel via a courier, you give the parcel to them. You say, please, please send this. But it's not an asynchronous operation because you can check when it's arrived, yeah, you can you can dial up, go on the web, and, but they give you a ticket. That's what you you issue. You say, please send this message. Please send this parcel to my grandmother in Australia, and they give you a ticket back, a number, which allows you then to phone them up and say, has has parcel eight seven five four two been delivered yet? Or you can track it on the web. That's the, that's the analogy for non how non blocking works. Um, so. This is the sort of, people always ask this, this is sort of out of bounds, but it's just interesting. You can allow you to, MPI allows you to check if any messages have arrived. So receive is, is a blocking form. Probe um, allows you to say, is there a message there? So people often say, so the catch 22 is when you issue a receive, you have to specify a receive buffer, which is to receive the incoming message. What happens if you don't know how big the message is? How can you allocate a receive buffer big enough to receive a message when you don't know how big the message is? Well, MPI Probe does everything. 
MPI received doesn't, except it doesn't actually receive the message. So an MPI probe says, if I were to issue a receive here, what message would I get? And that means the status is filled in. The status tells you who the message is coming from and also how big it is. So if you want to receive a message of arbitrary, arbitrary size, you do an MPI probe, you look at the status, you say, ah, the message coming is a megabyte long, you allocate that thing and then you do an MPI receive. So it's like doing a test receive. There's some, te there's some technicality in wildcard, but I won't work on that. So tags. Every message can have a tag. A tag is a non-negative integer value. Um, um, so actually many, many, many programs don't really use tags. Um, you can, the important point is when you do a receive, you specify a tag value, and that is a requirement. You're saying, I want to receive a message from you, and if I say tag equals two, I'm mandating that I, I'm only going to receive a message from you from tag two. If you send me a message from tag one, I'll ignore it. And that seems a bit kind of pointless, because you're saying you can tag a, a message with a value, you can only receive it if you know what the tag was. So in fact, tags are only use, really useful with wildcard, MPI any tag. And where this can be useful is if we have this master, this controller worker example, I'm sending you at work, then you send me the result, I send you out more work. How do I tell you this is the last piece of work? Well, how do I tell you to stop, okay? Well, it's not really obvious what to do, but what you can do is you can tag, I could tag my message with a value. Naught means stop, one means there's gonna be more data. And when you receive it, you could receive it with MPI any tag. So you'd receive the message from you regardless of what the tag is. Then you could look at what the actual tag value was, which is stored in the status variable, and then just make a choice based on that. So you can play games with MPI any However, you always have to specify a tag value. So a lot of MPI products just set all the tags to zero. Okay, that's, that's what a lot of people do. Because the flexibility there is you often don't need it. Um, um, also, you have to be careful that the MPI, the, the tag does have a maximum value. MPI guarantees to support tags of at least 32767, which is 2 to the something minus 1. Um, in most MPI implementations, this will be a lot larger, but it is finite. It might, I think on the Cray, it's a few million or something like that. So, for example, if you have a particle simulation with billions of particles, you might say, well, when I send, when I send information about particle I, I would tag that with I. You have to be careful with that because this tag value cannot be arbitrarily large. It typically will be in the order of millions. Or you, there's, a, there's a complicated way of finding out what it is, but you know it's not arbitrarily large. It's and it, it has to be at least 32,000. But um, that does catch people out. So we have seen. So on the Cray, on MPICH, which is what the Cray is based on, the upper maximum tag value is smaller. Than it's the, on, a, on open MPI. So when people put open MPI programs to the CREA, they often get, they sometimes get problems because their tag values are too big. That's only because they've not been careful about, about the tag value. I said tags are, they sound really useful, but they're not that useful. And I don't know if, if, if Gordon had time to go into this, but um, the reason they're not that useful is because of, of MPI preserved message ordering. So basically, if I, if I send you two messages, um, th th these have to be asynchronous, but I send you an asynchronous send, another asynchronous send, okay? People often won't worry, oh, well, wait a sec, when he issues to receive, which one does he get? Well, I better tag them. I better tag that with one and this with two so that you receive them in the right order. You don't need to do that because MPI remembers the order. So when you receive, you will get the, the most recent one. So it's, it, again, it's not obvious at all, but the fact that MPI preserves message order, um, it's actually, it's weird, but if MPI didn't preserve message ordering, it would actually be very difficult to write a correct program without tagging every message, because you'd always be worried the messages would overtake each other. So, you know, example, if you just think about it, it's actually, it's a, quite a, bit, a bit subtle, but it is actually, message order preservation sounds like a, Sounds like a fairly pointless thing, but it's really, really important. And as a lot of early message passing systems didn't have message order preservation, and that, but but it's actually quite good because the networks don't preserve message order. Okay, networks can take different routes, 
So actually, that you know, if I send a message, they could physically arrive in time in a different order, but MP has to remember. So, so that, my, my, my example is, uh, I'm on holiday in Australia and I'm sending postcards back to my mother, and I want her, I want her to read them in order. I want her to read them in the order I send them, okay? How can I achieve that? How can she get a message, a postcard from me and say, I won't read that one because if he sent one, then he sent one earlier and that which hasn't arrived yet. How can you achieve that? Tag yeah, and what, what, how would you do that? What tag would you pick? So, yeah, exactly. See, that's, that's sequential ordering. So basically, if you do a sequential ordering, one, two, three, four, you know, my mother gets a postcard with so the postcard five, and she says, well, the last one I got was postcard three. There must be one in flight. I will wait for that. And that's actually quite hard to, it's quite a lot of bookkeeping for MPI to do. And stuff. Anyway, that's, that's an aside. Some people say tag them with a date. Of course, that's not enough. You know, it has to be, it has to be an, you know, a, a sequential um, number. Uh, so communicators, we don't cover this a lot, but this is a fundamental design um, a feature of MPI, which some previous metric processes we didn't have. All the MPI communications take place within the communicator. And although communicators are lots of things, the fundamentally they're a group of processes. We've used this predefined communicator, the MPI com world, which contains all the processes. There's actually a little communicator called MPI com itself, which contains only you, but that's it. And there's other communicators. But MPI com world is the one which we use all the time. Um, a message can only be received within the same communicator from which it was sent. So you might, you might think, so if I'm going to receive a message from somebody, to receive the message it has to be received in the same communicator with which it was sent, and I have to, I have to receive it with the same tag with which it was sent. Okay? So that looks like double counting. The communicators have to match and the tags have to match. Well, the important point is you can't wildcard on the communicator. You can wildcard on the tag, you can't wildcard on the communicator. So a communicator is a guaranteed way of, of, of splitting. So if I split you, you guys into one communicator and you other guys into another communicator, messages you send in this communicator cannot be received by them, okay? So it's, it's a way of, of completely ring fencing things. And that has two main reasons. One, you can split MPI com world into pieces. So I could take MPI com world that had seven processes. There's a routine called MPI com split. You can look up the syntax if you want. And I could split into two communicators, com one and com two where COM1 has size equals 4 and COM2 has size equals 3, and you have to recompute your ranks, because by definition your rank is a number between 0 and n minus 1, where n is the size of the communicator. So clearly, in COM2, which has um, three members, these guys, have, these guys might be 4, 5, and 6 in COM, six in com world, but in this sub-communicator they're not ranked 0, 1, and 2. So if you play, around, if you play games with communicators, to split, so I think of it as partitioning the power of machine and software. You have to be careful to recompute your ranks. And these aren't globally unique. Your most important rank is your, your, your rank in Com World because it's globally unique. But if you start playing around with, with sub communicators, you have to recompute them. But actually, making a copy of Com World is, is useful. So there's a routine called MPI Com, du MPI Com Duplicate, which creates a new com communicator. And it's, it is actually useful to take MPI com world and duplicate it. So what you say is, we've got com, com world which contains everybody. We'll have a parallel universe called com2, which also contains everybody. Why is that useful? Well, if I'm writing a library routine, okay, a parallel library routine, my parallel library routine wants to send messages. I want to make sure that they are inadvertently received by some, some other receive. Okay? I want to make sure that my sent and receives in this library routine are completely ring-fenced from any other ones. And you might say, that's easy. The library routine will just tag all messages with 999. That's the magic tag, OK? But the problem is the user might issue a receive with MPI any tag. And then you'll, so, 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 so uh, if you want to write live routines, this is really the fun, one of the fundamental reasons that, that communicators were included in MPI. It allows you to write safe and flexible library routines. The first thing a library routine would probably do would duplicate com world to have its own secret communication space, which is, the same, all contains all the same processes, but it's logically distinct. And because you can't wildcard on communicator, you can't intercept them. So that's another reason. You may never do that, but that's one of the rationales for them. So that's clear. Um, so, 
summing why bother with all these send modes? Well, unfortunately, it's a little complicated. But you should understand S send and B send. S send is synchronous, making a phone call. B send is asynchronous, sending a letter or, or email. Send can be either synchronous or asynchronous. As an MCAS trying to be helpful here, it says, look, let me decide. I'll do it the best way. The problem is the best way can be synchronous or it might be asynchronous, and that means that it, sometimes your program might deadlock and sometimes it might not. So um, if, you, if you don't understand this, because the amount of system buffer space is variable, programs that run on one machine may deadlock on another. You should never assume that send is asynchronous. So that is why I say program with S send, so you will write a correct program, because if you have if you don't match your send and receive correctly, it will deadlock. And then once you've written it, can convert all the S sends to sends, and then it'll probably run a bit faster, because some of them might be buffered and you won't wait around. It's not a hundred percent guaranteed that a program that works with S send will work with send. But it, you have to write very contrived programs for that. So, so I mean, that is my 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 model is write a program with S send to guarantee you write the correct program, and then at run when you actually finish with it, convert all the S sends to sends, and it will run a bit quicker because the small messages will be buffered and there won't be all this waiting around. But it's un, it is an unfortunate complication in MPI. Question: What are these tags for? You don't need to use them. Perfectly except for several tags to zero. Some people like to tag one message with the rank of the sender for debugging. I don't know if it's particularly useful. Question, can I just use MPI combo? Yes. Many people never create new communicators. However, just as a matter of style, MPI combo is a horrible big ugly constant. So it's actually nicer to do something like MPI com com. Set com equals MPI com world. So when you call your if you write a program or, or a function or a subroutine, you have MPI com rank, com rank, com size, okay? This is the same thing as writing MPI com well for a beta here, but it has two advantages. One, it looks nicer, because MPI com well is a horrible big constant which makes all your lines overflow. But also, later on you might say, oh actually I now want to run this subroutine or function on a subcommunicator. Well that's fine, you just do com equals subcommunicator and the whole thing works, okay? So I, I, it's, it, and it's bad practice to hard code MPI com well in a hundred different places. This isn't making it, this is just a reference. This isn't doing a, these are the same communicator. If you want to actually create a copy of a communicator, which is logically distinct, you need to use MPI com do. But this is a, you can call it a shallow copy, or it's just the references of whatever, you, however you want to think about it. But this is probably a, a, be, a good way, of, a better way of, of um, stylistically doing it. So, um, as I said, it's, un I, it's unfortunate to have to touch on some of these technical issues early on, but it is really important to get them right. The next, so the exercise now is carry on with the, 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 the pie example, because it does illustrate. If you do get that finished, I think the next example on the sheet is, let's have a look, is ping pong. So ping pong is the classic way of, somebody asked very early on, how long does it take to send a message? Well, ping pong is the way you, classic use write the ping pong code where you just throw a message between two processes and measure the time. And um, you can work out the latency, which is the, the time for a zero length or small message, and the, you can work out the bandwidth by sending big messages. Um, so this is um, interesting um, for um, working out, trying to work out how, how fast the network is. It's actually much, much easier to write than the than, than the uh, than um, the Pi example. That's why this this illustrates a lot less about how to write correct message passing codes than the Pi example. The Pi example is far more important. However, if you get it done and you want to work out what the latency is here, and this is where you have to worry about. Well, actually, you'll have to if you want to test the the Archer network, you have to make sure that your two processes, say naught and one, are on different nodes of Archer. If they're on the same node, then the message is just going through shared memory, not over the network. So that's where you have to play around with this minus capital M and stuff like that. You might want to print out the processor name just to convince yourself they're on different nodes. Or send between naught and n, where n might where n is the highest number of processes. Anyway, you need to be careful about that. Um, so it's a bit of a it's interesting, but it's, it's technically a bit, a bit more difficult to get this to work. So again, you have to do many iterations. As I said in the thing, in my in my opinion, if you're if you report an elapsed time of much less than a second, it's noise. Okay. So I'll often see people run the pi example and say, oh my pi example goes 
slower on eight processes than four. How long do you think on eight processes? Oh, seven, 752 nanoseconds. That's just that's the time it took to print. You know, that is just dominated by noise. You know, you, you need to be measuring times which are an order of a second, in my opinion, for, for, so that you have to repeat things lots of times for them to be meaningful. 